Hello and welcome to my Lord ranking for the Vampire Coast. If you're not aware, this series of videos is building up to me ranking every single Legendary Lord in Warhammer 2, so if you want to check out the other parts of this series, there'll be a link to the playlist on screen now. So first to go over the rules and criteria. I'm going to be focusing on the campaign rather than multiplayer, because that's kind of my thing, and anyone can make anything work in multiplayer if they are good enough. I'm going to be taking into account everything I can that is specific to the Lord and Faction, this includes the unique effects they bring to their faction, the effects they have on their army, and of course the Lord themselves and their performance in battle. I'd like to also preface this by saying these are all my opinions, if you disagree with my ranking then by all means leave your ranking in the comments down below. Without further ado, let's get into our 4th place position. Coming in last place is Silostria Diaphan. Her faction starts on the east coast of Central America that connects the frozen mountains and Lustria. You've got lizards to the north, lizards to the south, Greenskins right next door, and High Elves across the sea. In conclusion, it's not good, and can be quite an experience of pain. Faction Mechanics actually grants plus 2 loyalty for new recruits, and minus 20% recruitment cost and upkeep for Cyrene and Mongol units. Her army gains 5% physical resistance and magical attacks for all units. The starter units are Cyrenes, which are an ethereal infantry unit that are speedy, and great at taking out other units with physical resist with their high damage magical attacks. Carronades, which are the long-range cannon of the Vampire Coast that deal massive damage against the toughest of armour, and Mongols, which are the sneaky half-corpses that excel at taking out infantry of all kinds. In battle, Silostra herself is a decent spellcaster with access to the Law of the Deep. She is ethereal, so is actually deceptively tanky as long as she isn't going against magical damage, but she is for sure not your frontline's hardcore fighter. Her mount gives her a lot more tanking and fighting capacity with a ton more HP, armour and melee stats, which you would expect given it's a giant crab. And finally, her items and abilities give her more magical power, an extra summon, and a debuff for enemies. Now, the reason for her being in last place is the rough starting location with the massive amount of enemies all waiting to have a turn kicking your ethereal ass. It really is just so rough to be that surrounded by so many people who are a lot more powerful than you, especially in the early game. Her faction effects are also pretty meh and just buff units that I would say most people won't be using a massive amount. Her army buffs are actually pretty strong and she's a decent fighter when she gets an amount, but none of it is really enough to make up for that campaign. Next up we have Aranes Assault Shite, and her faction starts on the island off the tip of the North Old World. You have Miragliano and Estalia to take care of, and beyond them the entirety of the Dwarves, Empire, Bretonia, and possibly even the Greenskins depend on how things go, so it can be a tad challenging, especially later into the game. Ikit is the only one nearby who you even have a hope of getting as an ally, but we all know how reliable Skaven can be. As for her faction mechanics, she has minus 100 relations with Norska, plus 25% chance of finding treasure maps, plus 50% income from raiding, plus 20% income from sacking, and access to the unique Sartos and units. The Sartos are Free Company, which are a chaff shredding early game melee infantry, and the Sartos are Militia, which are basically Free Company Militia, but kind of reskinned to be pirated. As for her army, she gains 8 melee attack and 20% weapon strength for all Sartos and units, and her starting units are the Sartos of Free Company, who I mentioned earlier, Deck Gunners, which are the pinnacle of Vampire Coast ranged infantry, with massive range and missile strength that allow them to take out basically anything, and Rotting Prometheans, which are tanky defensive crabos that are great at pinning down enemy units for your ranged units to pick apart. As for herself in battle, she provides plus 12 leadership in her aura effect, and she has very little armour, but a little sprinkling of physical resist, meaning she isn't the toughest, and against magic, she's outright squishy. Her damage is relatively good, with loads of armour piercing and anti-large damage, but her mount is obscenely terrible. It's the same mount that generic lords and heroes get access to, so it's not even special to her, and it's just pretty crap. It does give her more armour and HP, but she loses some melee stats and her resistance, so it won't be doing as much damage as quickly, and will be just about as squishy, so it's relatively pointless. Her items and abilities grant her defensive buffs, damage buffs, and enemy debuffs. Now the reason for her rank is that her starting location isn't as hard up front as Diaphin, but eventually it'll get to the point of pure hell if the old world factions manage to get a high enough power level and decide to come down on you. Her faction mechanics will allow her to make a good chunk of money quite quickly, and if she survives, she will likely become the richest of all the Vampire Coast Lords. Her unique units are fine, but don't shake up the meta massively, and the fact her army buffs only affect them is not the best. Finally, in battle she's alright, but very basic, and the fact that she just gets the generic mounts is insulting. Honestly, either her or Diaphin could go in either place, but I chose to give it to Aranessa due to the boost in economic potential. In second place we have the mad lad himself, Luther Harkon. His faction starts out on the Awakening, which is on the northeast of the aptly named Vampire Coast of Lustria. 
you don't get on with most people here as usual, so it can be a little bit hellish, especially since your army is quite weak to start off with, especially against the much stronger Lizardmen early game units. The only allies you do have a hope of getting are the other Vampire Coast factions nearby like Diaphane or maybe Noxilus, but they will either not be alive to help or not give a shit. You could also try to make friends with the Skaven nearby, but as I mentioned earlier, Skaven are about as reliable as a chocolate teapot. For his faction mechanics, he gains minus 60 relations with Lizardmen. Just in case you're wondering, is there any glimmer of hope that they will not attack you? No, they will almost certainly attack you every time. And all Lords and Heroes gain plus 6 to melee defense, making them a little bit tougher. As for his armor, he grants 25% magical resistance, 8 leadership when fighting Lizardmen, and provides 3 vampiric corruption wherever he goes. His starter units are Deck Droppers, which are the weakest and most pointless version of the Deck Droppers units, the Bloated Corpse, which is the big boy who beautifully belly flops to blow those blackguards to Bombay, and the Mongols, which I explained with Diaphin. As for Lufa himself, he suffers from a fractured mind, so like that one girl in high school, Lufa leaps from one mindset to another at the drop of a hat, and each personality has different effects, such as unlocking more magical potential or making him a more savage fighter. You can cure his mind by building the Ancient Vault that will make sure he is powerful and reliable. He's a hybrid weapons specialist with great range damage and melee prowess right out the gate, and his Death Shriek Terrorgeist mount is really great for giving him the breath ability as well as mobility and of course a lot more melee damage. His items and abilities grant him regeneration, magic defense, and debuffs for enemies. The reason for his rank is his starting location and constant war of the Lizardmen can be a real challenge, especially right out the gate. His faction effects are also pretty weak, but buffing lords and heroes in combat is never a bad thing, especially since heroes and lords are such a powerhouse for vampires both coast and count. His army buffs aren't incredible, but do help with the constant war versus Lizardmen, and Lufa in battle himself is pretty great for doing pretty much anything you need him to, aside from magic, and especially once he gets on that mount, he becomes even better. Taking our first place position, was it ever in any doubt that it was going to be Count Noctilus? His faction starts in the Galleon's Graveyard, which is in the exact middle of the map, in the middle of an ocean, equidistant from all land. Of course, he has no real allies nearby, but you can reach out to the other Vampire Coast factions quite easily and attempt to get them on side, and even confederate if you're using that one mod. Aside from that, you're free to attack in any direction you want with relative safety, since your capital is just that secure. For his faction mechanics, he gains war declaration missions with unique rewards, plus two to the pirate crew recruitment capacity, and minus one recruit duration for Necrofex Colossus units. His army gains minus 20% upkeep for Necrofex Colossus, and plus 15% weapon strength for all large units. His starting units are Depth Guard, which are the elite anti-infantry infantry of the coast with high armor and weapon strength that excel at chaff shredding. The Zombie Pirate Gunnery Mob, which are the starting weak ranged infantry that you either use as a frontline or replace immediately. And a Necrofex Colossus, which is the most powerful unit in the roster, and getting it at turn 1 is such a joke. As for Noctilus himself, he is a fantastic melee fighter with heavy armor and heavier damage, with a bonus versus large thanks to his halberd. He's super tough with great melee defense and armor, so can tank for your entire army for a very, very long time. He has access to the coast version of the Lore of the Vampires, which is basically the normal lore, but with a different summon. His Necrofex mount is, of course, incredible, and makes him into possibly the most powerful fighting lord in the game, and for sure the most powerful in the Vampire Coast. His items and abilities grant him regeneration, more magical damage, and an extra summon. Now, the reason for his rank is pretty self-explanatory, I mean, was it ever in any question? His starting location is the most defensible by far, his great campaign mechanics for making the most of the shipbuilding and Necrofex spam, his army effects are incredible for more Necrofex spam, and Noxilus himself is an incredible fighter with access to one of the best laws of magic in the game and one of the best mounts in the game. He was the clear choice and we all know it. And that concludes my ranking of the Vampire Coast Lords. If you did enjoy this video at any point, then please do consider leaving it a like. It really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more videos like this on Warhammer 2 and Warhammer 3 when it does come out, then be sure to subscribe to the channel. I'd like to take this time to thank all supporters of the channel, in particular Kobe Said So and Nifty Norm. You guys support me in the unclean ones today. It's really out of this world and I can't thank you enough. One more time, thank you so very much for watching. And for now, I've been Colonel Damders. And I will see you next turn.